everyone. Good rise, good dawning, great rising, great dawning. Welcome to the new day. Ekaro, all of my Avarisha. This is Chief Yuya, and bringing you, of course, another session. Dawning devotional from the shrine, lessons from the shrine, the forge, into the hunter dome, flip mode. <laughs> Just going through all the names we've been toying with, and I promise I will uh, have my assistant do that poll, and we'll see which one gets the most votes. Maybe, or maybe I might just do the dictator thing, because I already have some of my own favorites anyway. But anyway, um, let's get right to it, because I know many of you have to scuttle off to work, or to school, or to whatever it is that you need to do for the day, and um, what I've chosen to do for your dawning is just to give you something to think about for the day and maybe reflect on and ruminate, you know, during your drive or during your lunch break or whatever. So I wanted to mention something first. Uh, I see that many people have enjoyed, and, and even in some of the feedback people have spoken to me, you guys really seem to have jo enjoyed um, some of the stories that I tell sometimes, or no, I don't tell them, I share them because I didn't create them, they were shared with me. But some of the stories that were shared with me in my journeys and that I've learned over the years uh, as it pertains to Orisha and Ifa, a lot of you have enjoyed hearing those and one of, one of which, of course, during this session I shared was the story of Odu and Obatala and Orumila and Ogum. And of course, I invited you to uh, give your feedback, give your your interpretation of the stories, and many of you did. And I and I, I read them. I read all the comments on that particular story, you know, just to see see where you all are at with it, and you know where your minds are looking to go with it. And um, I'm glad that so many of you have chosen to be analytical and really kind of look at different things. I see some repeated points in terms of the information. Some of you kind of um, covered, you know, overlapped and hit some of the same points, which is cool, you know. Um, and just understand that it's never absolute. Like you might think, well, the story means this. It doesn't go like that. They're living and they're growing. And as you're learning and seeing more, you'll go back and say, oh, because it was a lot, a lot. Like no one mentioned really the inclusion of Ogun. You know, the fact that Ogun went first. When I looked in it, and I'll check again, but I didn't see that in the comments. There was a lot that was not um, really mentioned. So I'm not going to disregard anyone's interpretation or say, okay, you gave yours, now let me tell you what it is. I'm just going to give you a little extra, right? To Just something to play with, some, some other thoughts. One of which being, let's take the, the overall idea, Odu, right? Because this is who we were speaking about. Odu was a central character in this particular uh, story. And first thing to understand is that an Odu itself is a container. Okay, the Odu itself is not full of itself, but it is a container for something that is put inside of it. It's a repository. Okay, so that's the first thing that you have to understand. Uh, very similar to darkness. Darkness is nothingness, but it's everything. Now, why is it everything? Because something has put something inside of the darkness. So it's the same thing with Odu. When we cast Odu, we read Odu. And that particular Odu, uh, that story came out of was Osa Meiji. But Osa Meiji within itself is empty, right? So I'm, I'm going to run through a, a, a lot of points at once. For the sake of time uh, and I will also say this as I'm running through this some some of you may not catch everything all the time some of you may listen to these sessions and feel like huh <laughs> you know I, I don't get it you're not gonna you're not gonna get everything on the first time around you know be patient with yourself and be patient with your own learning process I have students that tell me I'm reading your book right now, and there's a particular chapter. I read that chapter literally eight times. I read it ten times. I got I bought two copies of the book because the one that I first bought is marked up and highlighted all over the place. Because the way I speak and the way I write and the way I teach is like the Odu. 
in that I'll give images and symbols that contain a lot of volumes of information, but I may present it in one sentence. So I'm not just going to say the cat jumped over the fence for you to understand, oh, the cat jumped over the fence. You know, I might say, you know, the one who's able to walk through the, the land of the witches at night without being harmed use its driving force to move from one boundary to another. You might say, what? What did he just say? <laughs> but I'm giving you a lot more information and in saying it that way. You know, I'm giving you uh, more to decode. So, you know, it's a way of, of speaking and sometimes just from years of teaching and years of learning and being around, in all honesty, indigenous Akibalanic culture, you know, we're dealing with romantic languages. So we're dealing with the language that's not as dead as English. So if you're around it for a long time, you may find that over time you begin to speak that way. You know, so I don't, and I mean, I've always had that. So I'm not going to blame it. I'm not going to blame it on Yoruba or Zulu or any other language that I've learned. I'm not going to blame it on that because I, since I was a child, I always kind of spoke in an abstract way because it was just easier for me to organize my own thoughts inside if I did it through through internal poetry, if you will. You know, and I, and I make effort to make to, to keep that inside and not necessarily when I'm teaching speak like that. But sometimes I give a little bit of it, you know. Um, and it's a superior way of communicating. Let me just tell you, it's, it's, it's superior. So when you're listening to these stories and these patakis or even listening to me, if you're listening to it with the same expectations that you would listen to something that's coming from a Western construct, yeah, you're going to get lost. You're going to feel like, huh, I don't get it. That's going to happen because the, the, the order of things is not told in the same way. Just like with this, well, with the story from Osa Meji, it was told, and as most Odus, it's kind of told backwards. We're used to stories, stories where it's once upon a time they lived as such and such and then they. Whereas when you're dealing with indigenous stories or you're dealing with the construct of Odu, it tells you the solution first. Bells, noise, colors coming. Was divine for so and so when they went to the Babalao to ask about. So the solution is given first, which would be like the end, and then kind of the middle point where they went to go for help. Well, why did they go for help? Well, let's go there. So it's almost like you get the end. I mean, yeah, you get the end, the solution. Then you get the why they went to go get the solution. Then you get the middle point after that, which would be like the story, you see? So it's, sometimes it takes a while to, to kind of change your rhythm and your format up to understand that. Be patient. <laughs> Just be patient. Patience gets you a lot more. Patience gets you a lot more in life. But anyway, so on that particular story, like I said, Odu being one of the central characters, Odu is a container, empty of itself. So what you have in the very beginning where you hear Olodumare speaking to Odu and saying, you know, and she's saying, well, if, if people don't come to me for advice, I'm going to fight them. And if and if people disrespect me, I'm going to do this. So you're seeing from the very beginning that she's got, she's angry. This isn't, if, if we want to correlate it to a female or feminine energy, this is an angry female, right? And so, and, and she's already not only angry, she's insecure. Now, why is she insecure? Because from the very beginning, she's, she's moving slow when they're leaving to come. And she's like, I don't have anything that I can do. And Oludumare didn't give her anything on top of what he already gave her. What he did was he assured her and he said, what are you talking about? I gave you this. I gave you that. You do have things that you, that you have, you see. But she was insecure and she was angry. So by the time she came to the planet, that repressed anger and those insecurities began to play themselves out in her behavior, right? Now, one of the first things that she had trouble accepting was that she came as an empty vessel. Odu, womb, 
right? The Odu itself is empty until the wisdom of Orumila is deposited inside of it. That's a different, well, you know, maybe that'll be another session, another time. But Odu by itself is just, it's, it's empty. It's like, it's like if you had a bunch of vessels shaped differently, right? You know, one is, is more oblong, one is wider, one is, you know, different colors. These would be the different Odu. And the way they contain and hold and cultivate the energy or the information is going to be different for each one. But in and of themselves, they're empty, right? So part of their talent is to receive. You see, because like he said, I gave you the ashe of motherhood. Well, how do I become a mother? I have to receive. Now, of course, if you want to follow some of the theology of, you know, um, different groups now who will tell you, like, women gave birth or give birth to, to children on their own and they don't need the presence of a man, go right ahead. That's up to you. Um, from this perspective from what I learn and what I teach, I have not actually witnessed any incidents of that, nor have I read about it and in our own uh, mythology in, in the same type of form that's being promoted, okay? So in that, we see that there has to be an interaction between masculine and feminine, no different than there was an interaction when we finally came to some sanity and solutions in that particular pataki. I'm trying not to say too much, that's so why I'm skipping around. I still want to leave a lot of space for you all to interpret on your own. Um, not interpret, dissect. So, it was when she came together with Obatala, and Obatala in himself, to, to many degrees, was ineffectual. Now, why was he ineffectual? When he had to go to, um, when he had to go to Orumila and was like, "Yo, she's wild," you know, she's <laughs> she's wilding out, you know. Um, part of the reason he was ineffectual because Batala's all white, doesn't touch the planet, you know. He's just he's he's, he's too clean, you know. What I mean, he's he's like, I'm not letting anything touch me. I'm not letting anything stain me. I'm not letting anything change me, right? But you have all of this repressed anger and energy of Odu, and essentially she's a drama queen, right? And we're talking about the essence and the, and the, the prototypical energies of feminine and masculine here. So her drama queenness was of great value because she created, in many senses, that, that Egungun costume. Why? Because she had a flair for the dramatic. If you if and if you've never seen an Egungu masquerade, you can probably search right now and just look at some images so you get a sense of what the costumes look like and you probably have a better understanding of what I'm saying. Right? So she had the flair, she had the the the, the um the drama aspect of it all and the colorfulness of it all and, and even the frightfulness that she was able to give to people because she had all of this emotion pent up. But she didn't have the creative voicing that Obatala had. So it was when he gave voice to her creativity that now the entire operation now became effectual. So by himself, by himself, he just represented, he represented the logical aspects, you know, or what we would say the logos. Her by herself representing the emotional aspect or the, or the empathetic aspect. And when you bring those together, now we were able to create this proper experience of the Egungun, this proper masquerade. But by themselves, they were ineffectual. One was too angry and wild, and, and one um, had the voicing, but didn't have the ability to catch the people, to draw the people, you see, to pull them in. You'll notice that even in the conscious groups with a lot of the teachers, like now, a lot of the teachers who are more popular, they don't have any real information. I mean, I'll keep it real because I'm not saying anybody's name, but there's no real information. They have flair. They're like some of the guys, they're hyper emotional, they curse people out a lot. Um, they're preachers, basically. It's just preacher hype. A lot of the females are preacher hype too. I, I saw a video uh, a little earlier, just like a snippet of someone who's very popular. And she was just like, just preacher hype. And people were like, man, she's such a queen and this and that. And 
she was just like, you know, once you connect with your higher self, there's nobody who can stand in your way, no matter what they say to you. It's like the same regurgitative nothingness, you know. Um, but that's all that, that preacher hype, but th there's no combination of intellectual logic. See, now when those two come together, now you got something dangerous, right? So a great example of that would be like a, um, Malcolm X, uh, um, Jewel Pulcrum, to some degree, but she's a little bit more logical. Shaharzad Ali, great example of that. High intellect, high dramatics. You know, she's funny, um, she's emotional, but at the same time, she's hitting you with straight facts. Jewel Pukum is kind of, she's not as as emotional, but just be her whole energy, you know, the way she dresses and her hair and everything, she comes with that, just a beauty with a kind of flair. Um, as opposed to you take someone like a um, Francis Cress Welsing, right? Who was more logical. She wasn't cracking jokes and things like that. She just, down the very Ogun, she come with an afro and her leather jacket, <laughs> you know. So when you have a combination of that, it, it can be really potent, you know? And that's that combination of, of male and female. So, Odu not really understanding her place of being a container of the wisdom, she went out to go do everything that she wasn't supposed to do. Why? Because she was like that female who doesn't know her place and wants to do everybody else's job. I could do this, I can go there, I can go there, I can do that. Well, there's somebody who's supposed to do those different things. And you're spilling all into everybody else's boundaries and everybody else's place without understanding your place is to, is to receive all of these different things. That's your gift of motherhood. You can't be a mother while you're running around trying to do everybody else's job. I feel like I need to say that twice for some of you. Women. Those of you who call me and say, I want to mate. And I don't know, and I don't know that. Nah, nah. And I say, well, what have you been doing all this time? Focusing on my career. I have 13 degrees. <laughs> but I still can't find a mate. Hmm. So you're doing everything else but what the Most High gave you the greatest talent to do and be. You're not focusing your energy on being filled up. You're focusing your energy on going out and doing what you could never effectually do anyway. Eh, we'll save that for something else. We probably won't save that for anything. That's more like an internal our new talk. Um, but anyway, because that one, that one goes much deeper. So me not trying to give too much away, because I want you to still play with the story as you want. Remember also the Yashi of the bird. Now the significance of the bird, one of the significance is the beak, is the ability to ta, 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 peck, you know, and what is the pecking? Cutting through, cutting through. So just like if you've ever seen an Ngungu masquerade, it's very hard not to be involved if you're anywhere near them because they come and get you. They pull you, they make you dance, they antagonize you, they dance in front of you. That's the bird pecking through your ego, pecking through different situations where it would normally be stopped and put to a rest. It's cutting through, cutting through, cutting through, cutting through. All right, so that's part of that bird, Ashe. Like, that's why Obatala complained. It was like she is going everywhere she's not supposed to go. One, because she's a water energy, so water just seeps all over the place but also because she has the ashe of the bird. She can fly different places and use that beak to cut through different things. You know, you fellas know what I'm talking about. You know when your woman says something that's so cutting and you don't know if you wanna kill her or wanna or run away from home. <laughs> you start having those teenage thoughts, you know. <laughs> you get in trouble and you go in your room and you're like, <laughs> but then some are like, we kill him tonight. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that because that's that actually happens and it's bad. That's bad, okay? It's bad. But anyway, so that's just some things to kind of play with with that particular story. Now, real quick, 
because I'm, uh, you know, I'm longer than I wanted to be. I wanted to share another story, but I'm not going to give too much. I'm not going to hardly give any breakdown. I'm going to let you guys do the same thing. Comment, give your breakdowns, and then I'll come back later. All right. So I spoke about Ifa yesterday, and I spoke about the wisdom of Ifa, and you know a lot again. And in this original, not original story, but previous story, I spoke about Odu and, and giving birth and the Ashe of motherhood, right? So let's take a look at Ifa for a second, in particular Orumila. Alright, now some of you may say, well who the heck is that? I've done shows on Orumila. If you don't know who Orumila is, as tempting as it may be to want to ride along with the rest of the, cl the class right now, just stop this. Just stop it. <laughs> and do a search, Chief Yuya Orumila, O-R-U-N-M-I-L-A. O-R-U-N-M-I-L-A Orumila, okay? And then get some get some good background, you know, because I'm not going to do the breakdowns on everything. We don't have time for all that. I know some people have already commented on that, like, well, what's this, what's that? Trust me, everything I'm talking about now, I'm giving you background, all right? So, there was a time, right, when there weren't a lot of Inian or humans on the planet. So the Orisha or who would you you would consider like deities were here and they were hungry. I'm going through a quick now. They were starving. Not starving, but they just had they didn't have a lot of food because they didn't have a lot of people giving them offerings. And you know, Orumila, he was at the time he was a fisherman. He fished. And he was fishing, and he was like, man, stomach is growling, man, my ribs are touching, back pockets of my jeans is slapping it against each other, you know. So he was like, you know, he's thinking about it, he was like, let me let me hit up Eshu, because Eshu is, is real creative, and he's got a lot of, he's real crafty, he might know a way that we can fix this situation, right. So Rumila goes to Eshu, and he's like, look, man, I'm hungry, man, you know, you know how to get food? And Eshu was like, yo, I'm, I'm in the same situation. So Eshu was like, your mama giving you money? And Rumi was like, no. And Rumi was like, your mama giving you money? And she was like, no. So Eshu was like, well, we're going to rob the two train. Now I'm saying, they didn't say that. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> that part did happen. <laughs> if I would have wrote the Pontac key, I would have put that in there. But, uh, but, you know, that's why I was born now. Cause they was like, don't, don't, don't give birth to him back there. He gonna mess up all about that kid. <laughs> so this is what happened. So he goes to Eshu, he tells him the situation. Eshu's like, look, man, I need money too, right? So not money, I need food too. So Eshu said, I know what we do. He said, if you can get me 16 palm kernels, I can show you how to tell the future. And then if we can tell the future, we'll always have wealth. We can always we'll know when to plant, where the food will be, where the money will be, boom, 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 boom. Our lives will be much better. So Rumi was like, I like that idea. I don't have 16 palm kernels. However, the chief, Arangan, does have 16 palm kernels. Well, he has, he, has, he has palm tree. He has a palm tree on his property. So they go to Arangan and they, and they told him, you know, what the caper was. Listen, we're trying to get these palm kernels so we can tell the future so Rangan was like yeah definitely he was he was he was with it he was like because I would love to know the future you know so he and his wife Orisha D sometimes you'll see it Orisha B B and D uh, mean to give birth right so so Right, so he goes with his wife, Orisha B. Orisha B. B means to give birth. And they go to their palm tree. But the problem was the tree was too high, right? So they tried to climb it at first, but what the problem was the tree was too high and the um and the the 
the sides of the tree were too smooth for them to climb up, so they couldn't they couldn't get a good grip. They couldn't get a good grip to climb. I'm with you. I'm with you. Right. So what they did was they they sat back. They retired. They they was like, all right. Think about this, right? It's similar to what Styles P said when he was like, you know, you know, sit down, plug the flint, the fan in, let the sweat dry off, and then grab the cannon, right? You gotta cool off sometimes when you're in a situation you're trying to, you racing and trying to figure, do this, do this, do that. Sit down, relax, plug the fan in, cool off, let the sweat come off, and then get your gun. So they sat back and it was like, I know what we'll do. So they went and got some monkeys, and they like they drove the monkeys from the bush onto their property, and the monkeys ran up the tree, right? So of course at the top of the tree they see this palm fruit, so they eating the palm fruit, eating the red fruit that's around the kernel, and as they're eating the monkeys, the kernels are dropping onto the ground. So they go run over there, they get 16 palm kernels, and Arisha B then takes the palm kernels and puts them in a in a in a you know with some fabric and straps them to her back, puts them behind her on the back like if you would strap a baby to your back. And she brings those com those palm kernels, what well, they together, bring those palm kernels to Arumila and Eshu. So, Eshu then teaches Arumila how to do the divination, you know? <laughs> so, now, to this day, as Baba Lao, when we are doing divination, we give honor to Arisha B. We give honor to Aranga. And here's another important thing. I'm not doing a breakdown. I'm just going to give you a little bit. Whenever you go to get divination, even me, myself, I haven't done a lot of divination sessions in my life, like official divination where I'm sitting on someone's mat. I can literally count on one hand the amount of divination that I've done. Outside of like initiations and ceremonies where like I had to, you know, like after the ceremony, before the ceremony, but I mean like just I need a reading. It's only a few times. But every time I've had one of my consorts with me. Every single time. Right? And it's always that question like, oh, do you want her to leave the room? No. Mm -mm. She's going to take notes. I'm going to sit and listen. She's going to take notes. Well, what if something real private comes up? Well, you better make sure you're with someone that you have a lot of faith in, and, or like some people say, trust. Right? So, to this day, when a person, when a man gets divination, if he's not married, his mother should always be there with him. And if he is married, his, his wife or consort, but his wife should be there with him during the divination session. That's, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you work that one out. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say. I, I'll give you some. I'll give you some later. But I want you all to in the comments, like you did last time. You, you figure out. All right. Um, and like I said. For some of it, it's going to go completely over some people's heads. For some, it's not going to go over their head. And in the middle of that, it's going to be the truth. All right? So, just always also know, the only thing I really say that has no meaning is um, and, you know, and you see. But you see has meaning. Yeah, I know. I, I hear myself. You probably, you guys probably didn't know that I, that I know that I say um all the time. And I say, you know, all the time. I know I do that. I know. <laughs> um, but every word is said for deliberate reason. Don't skip over them. All right? That's that's the little hint. Don't skip over them. Everything I say is purposeful and meaningful. And if you realize that, it'll be easier. You'll have an easier time breaking down what was presented to you. But, um... Yeah, so that's how Romula, you know, was able to do divination. And then, of course, 
he taught his first student then who became the first Babala. That would be another another story. Okay. But yeah, Arisha Arisha B and Arangan got those sixteen palm kernels. Odu had the ashe of motherhood and the bird. I just gave you a hint. <laughs> All right. So that has been our session. Uh, I trust everyone's going to travel well today. Travel safe, man. And we're on, we're on a time of great change. Great change. And it's time to take some giant steps. Giant steps, man. We talk about unplugging from the matrix. Some of us gonna have to take some giant steps and leaps outside of the matrix and we're gonna end up upsetting some people who are stuck in the matrix and don't wanna move. We're gonna really end up upsetting them. And there's a part of us that we're gonna upset. The part of us that is still allegiant to what doesn't work for us. But you know, <clears throat> Time is it was is an amazing thing, you know, how quickly it can move, you know, in our lives. I was telling uh one of my youth yesterday, we were talking about how